that uh, mode. And our first speaker is Dr. Marvin Pritz. He is the um, Department of Horticulture Chair at Cornell University, and he has been the small fruit um, specialist for many years and has done a lot of work with uh, high tunnel growing with raspberries and blackberries. And Dr. Pritz, I'm going to move it right to you. Okay, and it's really nice to see so many people from so many different places attend the webinar today. And I'd like to compliment Laura on scheduling a meeting about keeping plants warm and dry and probably the coldest day of the year and maybe even a decade for some of you. Uh, I want to talk about producing raspberries and blackberries out of season using high tunnels and a little bit of greenhouse. Most of this will focus on high tunnels. And there are lots of reasons why uh, we can use high tunnels and greenhouses. One is that uh, we can improve overwintering of our plants, which is probably going to be real important this year. Our season is extended, so the fruits are worth more. Fruit quality is higher and yields are greater. Here is just a photo of uh, some thornless blackberries and some red raspberries. After winter, and this often happens in more northern climates, they get killed by cold winter temperatures. The new primacanes grow just fine, but the old canes die. The price off season, if you can somehow f bring those crops on earlier or uh, produce them later, can be quite high. Here's a photograph I took from a grocery store and you can see $4.99 for a half pint of raspberries and $6.99 for a half pint of blackberries. That's pretty good money. High tunnels are being used all around the world right now. Spain and Portugal uses them a lot. Scotland use them and even California most of the raspberries now are uh, growing to crop under these tunnels not so much for warmth but just to keep the moisture off the fruit the quality is so much better when the raspberries don't get wet even from dew even if it doesn't rain so these are taken off everywhere uh, California will even go to the extent of putting up wind barricades because we know that too much wind damages raspberry plants as well and this farm here, not only did they trellis the raspberries, but they put up uh, this netting here to reduce the wind on the plant so that the, they produce more. Ma Marvin, can I interrupt just for yes. a second? I'm sorry. Um, we are having a number of people say that they don't see any picture, which is an un a different um, problem than we've had before. Hmm. So yeah. I just am wondering, how is anybody able to see the video, the Okay, we have some people that see it and some people that don't. Um, okay, good. So, uh, may, perhaps uh, it is taking a while to load, so thank you very much for all of your comments. Um, I am hopeful that those of you that are not seeing it, that maybe it will load in a bit. And... Um, oh, uh, okay. Hmm. There is somebody that just said that... Um, so David Culp, you have said that the Adobe Presenter, uh, maybe it is loading. It's just your connection may not be fast enough. And so I'm hopeful that you, had, you, you were supposed to add a load in when you, lo when you got on to the program. Okay, so I think it's just taking a while for this presentation to load. I'm not sure why that is. Perhaps it's frozen. It's, <laughs> it's a big presentation, too. There's lots of pictures. Okay, so. so let's just give it a moment, and hopefully everybody is there. Okay, great. Um, sorry, sorry, Marvin, I'll let you continue. Okay, so if you can see the photograph here, you can see what can happen to a tunnel if you have too much wind and the wind can be damaging to the uh, tunnels if you don't manage them correctly. But the point I want to make is that the tunnels are good for temperature management, moisture management, and wind management, and our plants can really benefit from that, particularly here it says northeast, but all throughout the northern tier of states. Uh, we have three reasons why we could use tunnels, and lots of other places around the world only have one reason, and they use tunnels for that one reason. We have all the possible reasons to use a tunnel in our climate. And so we've been experimenting with different ways of using tunnels to grow raspberries off season with higher quality. The first um, plant I want to talk about are fall fruiting raspberries. These are plants that produce fruit in the first year canes. They grow up, they flower, 
in the late summer. They produce fruit in early fall. And we can start picking that fruit, at least for us, or late August, early September. And as you can see from the uh, figure here, we start to pick in late August. We start picking up in September. And just about the time we get into full production, we get our first frost at the end of September, early October, and um, we're done. And that's a shame because there's a lot more fruit on those plants. Now, one of the advantages of a high tunnel is that we can continue to pick that fruit even after the frost comes. Now, there are ways of accelerating the harvest uh, without using a high tunnel, and row covers are one way to do that. So when the plants first come out of the ground, you can cover them with a row cover, like you see here, and that will accelerate the growth, and they'll actually produce fruit earlier and yield faster. And when we've done that with raspberries, we can see that without a cover, this is our yield distribution in our season. These are days after August 10th. When we put on a cover for April, we bring that crop on earlier. And when we put that cover on in March, we can bring it on even earlier. So that's indeed one way you can accelerate the harvest and bring that crop on before that frost comes. But you have to do that one way at a t one row at a time. And this is what we used to do until the uh, high tunnels came along where we could cover you know, at least four rows at a time. And it was much more efficient at doing it that way. Plus, it was easier to pick the fruit without having to deal with those individual row covers. So our first strategy with the high tunnel was to look at uh, the thickness of the row cover, by the way, was the 0.6 ounces per square foot. It doesn't have to be a heavy cover. We actually looked at heavy and lighter covers, and it didn't make a difference. It just seemed like uh, a row cover worked. And plastic over top of the plants, that low to the ground, did not work. Uh, that actually probably made the plants too hot, and raspberries don't like heat. So a row cover worked better in that situation than a plastic cover. But when you go to a high tunnel, the tunnels are much higher and you get ventilation and the temperatures don't climb to nearly the level they do in a high tunnel as they would in a sheet of plastic over a low growing plant. So uh, the first strategy is to look at these cultivars of raspberry and actually maybe even try to delay harvest which we would never do in the field but to try to get fruit later in the season from when it's normally available. So here's one of our tunnels and it shows a crop of heritage raspberry being harvested. The plants inside there look beautiful. They're vigorous. There's lots of fruit. But the date is October 20th. And for those of you who are from upstate New York, October 20th, you know, the leaves are off the trees by then. We've had several hard frosts. And plants outside are done fruiting. There's no fruit. The leaves are starting to drop. But inside the tunnel, you can see we're just going gangbusters. Caroline is a good variety for the high tunnel in mid-October. You can see the fruit looks really nice. Uh, we looked at a bunch of different varieties to see which ones would do well for us. And we find that you know, Heritage does just great in a high tunnel. Caroline does great. Autumn Britain was when we tried it. It comes on early really well, but then it drops off pretty fast. Uh, Josephine is another variety that actually comes on strong later and had really good flavor and good size. So this is one that we can grow in a high tunnel without any manipulation and get a really nice late crop. Here's just some yield data over a couple of years of Autumn Britain and Caroline Heritage and Josephine. Uh, looking at yields, Caroline and Heritage, as I mentioned before, do really well. Autumn Britain, not quite so well. The one that was impressive was Josephine, not so much because of yield, but the berry size is pretty remarkable. The size of the fruit is about twice the size of Heritage or Caroline, which is more or less our standard. And the flavor is amazing. It's really, really good. It tastes like a really strong, great raspberry. Yeah, and these plants are all planted in the ground, just like you would normally plant in the field. And I'll show you what we do here in a second. But yeah, they're just planted in the ground, and the tunnels are put up over the plants. Here's Heritage, and compare that to Josephine, and you can look at the weight on here, and some of the berries are coming off at over 7 grams a piece. So we're pretty excited about Josephine as a variety for late season. One of the things we wanted to do is have Heritage come in later, too, because 
in the field we don't want it later but in a tunnel why not have it later if you got it protected for a while so we looked at several different ways of growing the plants and manipulating the plants uh, we covered the plants with straw in the early winter, late winter early spring to see if we could delay their emergence from the ground to see if that would delay their flowering and fruiting when the canes came up out of the ground we mowed them off and forced them to start over again when the canes are about two and a half feet tall we pinched the tips to force them to grow branches and that would slow them down we did the same thing a little bit later and then we had our controls that we didn't do anything to and I'll just show you the tunnel here uh, before it was covered the plants are grown in the ground about seven foot spacing between the rows uh, we mulch them with straw the first year we also incorporated compost into the area before we planted and we just grew the plants for uh, a year the following year for our mulching treatment we removed the snow towards the end of February on the plots and we replaced that snow with straw to insulate the ground and hold in the cold and to try to hold the plants back and indeed when we look later on in the season and when the plants started to grow we can see that the ones that were mulched had, were shorter and further behind the ones that were not mulched now remember this is intentional because we want to deliberately delay the fruiting until later if we can mowing made a big difference yeah, the plants that we mowed off and forced to start over again were further behind than those that were not mowed, the controls. And that difference was maintained uh, throughout the year. We also pinched plants and we pinched the growing tip when they were about two and a half to three feet tall, forced them to grow these lateral branches. That slowed them down a little bit. And you can see that difference is maintained throughout. Then we had all those treatments and then uh, towards the fall of the year, late summer, early fall, we covered the tunnel. The plants flowered and there we are covering the tunnel on September 13th. The one thing is you don't have to have these tunnels covered all the time. In this case here we only wanted to produced the crop late so if we would have covered them early it would have brought the crop on earlier and we really didn't want that we wanted to see how we could do by having a late crop so we didn't want them to accelerate their growth too much so we waited until September to cover the tunnel and there we are pulling the row cover over the tunnel pulling it down and there we are harvesting a uh, question came up how's himbo top We've looked at Himbo Top at Geneva in our variety trial, and it does pretty well in a tunnel too. It's just a little bit uh, funky in terms of picking it. It's a little bit hard to uh, see the fruit sometimes, but in terms of flavor and size, it's a, a pretty good one as well. One of the dilemmas we have in these tunnels is they're only so big, and you can't really look at a lot of different things at one time, but I'd encourage you, uh, Brett, to contact Courtney Weber it's CAW34 at Cornell.edu, and he's got a lot of data on Himbo Top along with a lot of other varieties for the high tunnel. We've just looked at the ones that um, are a little bit more common that we thought people could get a hold of and, and use. The one thing we were concerned about in the high tunnel is pollination late in the year. You know, in September, you're going to get bees, and we were a little bit concerned about that, but we found that the bees love the high tunnel, and they come in and droves and just hang out in the tunnel here are, are bumblebees all over the place uh, they love that cool dry environment keeps them out of the frost from outside and we had no trouble with pollination of our flowers in the house here we are mid-october lots and lots of raspberries again outside we've had frost already you wouldn't see this outside but inside we have lots of fruit now towards the end of october early november we sometimes get nights when it gets down in the mid to low 20s but only just for maybe one night and then it warms up again you got another week or so of really decent weather and what we do in those really cold nights is we know that the plastic that single layer of plastic will not protect the plants uh, when it gets that cold but if we take a row cover and throw over the plants for just that night and then take it off the next day often that's enough to get the plants to that one or two cold nights and then we're done 
Question is, why are those bird scare devices inside that tunnel? Well, remember, we didn't cover that tunnel until uh, September 13th. So during the summer, the birds would come in there and roost. And it wasn't so much a problem eating the fruit as it was. We just didn't like the birds up there pooping on our heads when we were trying to manipulate canes and prune and stuff like that. Here we are November 5th in Ithaca, picking pretty decent fruit. And we got fruit all the way up till November 15th. And we've done this for multiple years now. And November 15th is kind of about the end of the line on the raspberries. They'll still be there, but they don't ripen very quickly. So we s cut it off then. In terms of how these treatments worked, this blue line here is a control. This is not doing any manipulation. And you can see that right here is when we would get our first frost. So typically we'd be done in the field right about this point here. But because we have the tunnel, the plants keep on producing fruit all the way up till 14 weeks after August 22nd. That's a pretty long harvest season, 14 weeks. By doing these pinching treatments, a little bit of late pinching, or early pinching, we were able to delay the peak of production until end of October. And so that was actually kind of a good way of spreading out the harvest peak. Having some that you don't pinch and having some that you pinch and it shifts the production peak about four weeks later. The other treatments we, that I explained to you, the mulching treatment and the mowing treatment, they didn't do as well. Uh, so we're not exploring those any further or recommending those any further. But the pinching looks really good. Pinching either, you know, right when a plant is about two and a half to three and a half feet tall seems to be about the right time to do that. Another year's data, same thing. You can see the control plots here. Uh, frost comes here. We normally be out of the business just when we're getting started, but we can keep on going with the controls and with the pinching. This early pinching when the plants are about two and a half to three feet tall. Uh, shifted the production peak later, and it really didn't. We didn't suffer that much in terms of yield. Here's the yield uh, from the control, and with the pinching treatments, and you can see some reduction, but uh, not a lot with the early pinching. Berry size wasn't affected. The mulching and the mowing treatments, I said, didn't do very well. So the second strategy was. Uh, take these primocanes and instead of getting them to fruit late maybe we could cover the tunnels early and bring them on earlier and not only that but remember I showed you the row covers over the plants in the field when they were just starting to emerge from the ground well we thought well could we do the same thing inside a high tunnel so not only do the plants when they start up have a, a big high tunnel over them but they also have a row cover or even a sheet of plastic over them when they're short and small and just coming up the ground. We could really maybe accelerate the harvest season quite a bit by doing that. So we looked at that and this is the end of the year um, when they're starting to harvest. Here are plants in the field that are growing outside the high tunnel. This is Heritage and the same variety in the high tunnel with some of these treatments and my goodness these plants grow like crazy in the high tunnel really really tall and in fact the Heritage plants grew so much that it was a real problem harvesting them. They were just a little bit too tall for my short helper here, Jenny. So we sometimes had to stand on a little stool to get the fruit off the top. So did that mean that these plants here had much higher yield than these plants that were growing in a field? Well, we looked at that and the size of the plant, the fruit, didn't really make much difference. And the yields actually didn't really make much difference either. The yields were pretty good. Uh, no matter if we covered them early or not. The difference was that the ones that we covered early came on sooner, so the ones inside the tunnel uh, ripened earlier and maybe went a little bit longer than those in the field where the harvest was delayed. But for the most part, the yields didn't really change that much. The Playing the plastic in September for extended fall harvest the way I explained earlier, gave us 2,860 half pints per tunnel. Applying plastic under the tunnel in early spring for accelerated harvest brought the crop on earlier, but the yield was just almost identical. The question is, since you're growing those really long canes, what if you saved those canes through the winter and then fruited them the following spring? Would it make a difference? Would it be worthwhile doing? How much yield do you get from doing that? 
So we uh, did a study where we double cropped versus single cropped these plants, both in the field and in the tunnel. And here's our fall crop, 5,600 grams per meter. This is, uh, and then when we held them over and harvested again those now flora canes in the summer, we got about 50% more yield by doing that. Again, you have to overwinter the canes, but we did get an inc uh, some additional yield because of that. Same thing in the field, a, far, a fall crop, and if you hold it over and harvest those floor canes the following summer, you get about 50% more yield, maybe not quite that much. So um, it might be worth it. It might not be. I know our summer helpers didn't particularly like picking those floor canes in the summertime. The crop is a little bit shorter and lower a little bit harder to pick, but you definitely got additional fruit from that. The big difference between the field and the tunnel in this case was that the yields were somewhat less in the field than the indoor tunnel, and the marketable yield was better inside the tunnel than outside. A third strategy was trying to overwinter tender blackberries and raspberries in a high tunnel. So, you know, in a year like this, we're probably going to get some blackberry winter kill for sure, and maybe some raspberry winter kill. And can a high tunnel protect your plants from that? Well, you know, this tunnel is only just a single sheet of plastic. It's not very substantial. And, you know, the tunnels we're using for overwintering are these peaked tunnels. They're not the, like the hay grove type, which is rounded at the top. The, that plastic really has to come off in the fall before the snow hits. These tunnels here are specially constructed with a little bit of reinforced steel. The uh, pipes are about four feet apart instead of five. But, and so it will hold a snow load. It will shed off of these points. But um, it is still only a single sheet of plastic. And these tunnels don't have supplemental heat. So if a plant can survive in there, the temperature is still getting pretty darn cold. But what we found is that not only do the plants survive in those tunnels, even with a single sheet of plastic, but they really thrive. These are some thornless blackberries in June. It's only June, and the canes are already really, really tall. And if you don't do anything with these canes, by the time the end of the summer comes, they can be 15, 20 feet tall. It's amazing how well they grow. And here we are looking this down the alleyway between the rows, and you can just see these thornless blackberries just uh, really make a jungle there. In fact, one of the challenges is managing the vegetation on these rat, uh, blackberries inside the tunnel and outside. And you can see just a comparison between outside thornless blackberries and inside. They grow really, really well in that tunnel environment. And they overwinter well, too. And here's a picture. This appeared in our, our college newsletter. They uh, did a little feature article on high tunnels. And you can just see in the background the amount of blackberries that are produced in these high tunnels. It's really remarkable. But compared to outside, there's not a lot going on. In fact, we hardly ever harvest much of a crop outside. But inside the tunnel, they do real well. Uh, we had a high tunnel at Willsboro this year, which is up along Lake Champlain, just south of the Canadian border, right along the Vermont border. We grew some raspberries, both inside and outside the tunnel there harvested them this year and you can just see the difference between outside yields and inside yields. There are more than twice as much inside as outside, uh, especially for jewel black raspberry, Encore. Uh, the high tunnel just made a huge difference in that very cold climate up along Lake Champlain. This is the back down in Ithaca, a little bit more mild. Uh, black raspberries, we don't get a huge increase in yields when we look at the difference between outside and inside near about you know 28 30 percent greater yield um, size is usually bigger marketable yields bigger uh, harvest seasons longer but uh, the blackberries are what really respond to the high tunnel between inside and outside here's some data on four three varieties Doyle a Wichita and Triple Crown and and every, any variable we looked at, whether it be season length or size of fruit or yield per plant or percent marketable fruit, inside the tunnel was greater than outside. 
every variable, every case, every variety. And I mean the yield differences were huge. Basically, fruit needs plants outside, you just doesn't do it. I mean, you might get a little bit of fruit, but boy, when you put them inside a tunnel, they just yield like crazy. The yields are just so much greater inside than outside the tunnel. And here's just some yield distribution curves of uh, Doyle that's inside the tunnel and outside the tunnel, and you know, there's no comparison. You don't have to be a statistician to figure out that there's significant yield differences between these plants. And these are different years, different varieties, and we get the same thing every time we do it. Again, same data, inside, outside. The yields are just remarkably different inside than outside. So, I think I've made a case of blackberries, thornless blackberries can do really well inside a tunnel. The one problem we've had with those, however, are uh, rodent damage. This year, when we went out in March and April to look at our plants after a long winter, almost all the, in fact, all the canes were girdled just like this from about a foot up, maybe a foot and a half up from the ground from rabbits. They got into the tunnel over the winter. These nice blackberry canes don't have thorns on them, and they fed themselves in the bark all winter long, and we didn't have any yield from our blackberries this year because of the rabbit damage. So that's something to watch out for. This year, the high tunnels have chicken wire around them to keep the rabbits out. So we'll see how that works. Then our fourth strategy is to grow primocane fruiting blackberries under tunnels. Now these are relatively new. They were just developed in Arkansas about five years ago. These grow like the heritage red raspberry, except they're blackberries. And the blackberry canes grow up and they flower in the s late summer and they fruit in the fall and give you an opportunity to have fruit in October. Now when we grow these plants outside in Ithaca, we tend not to get a crop because it's just too late. We get a little bit, the, ras the blackberries are just starting to ripen, but then the cold weather comes and we're done. But if we could grow these under a high tunnel, uh, the plants can keep on growing. These blackberries were developed in Arkansas, so we have to convince the blackberries that they're still growing in Arkansas, even though it's upstate New York, and by putting them in a tunnel, we uh, can convince them to do that. So these are what the blackberries look like in the fall. They look like regular blackberries. And here's our blackberry plots, and we did some experiments on them, just like we did with the raspberries. We did some pinching of primocanes, we did some bending of primocanes, we had control plots, and uh, we l covered the tunnel late in the summer, we let them flower, we let them fruit, we harvested the plots, and this is what the, the crop looks like. You can see the yield potential here is pretty good. Uh, the berry size is really large, really big fruit, and the flavor is pretty good. Uh, these are the treatments we examined to control the two different pinching times and bending the canes uh, when they reach the first wire to see if that somehow would promote more fruiting and earlier fruiting. Here's our pinching treatment, same as with the red raspberries. We did some bending treatments and I don't, I don't have the yield data all done yet, but the pinching treatments work the same way they do with the red raspberries. They actually, in this case, seem to increase the yield a little bit and they uh, bring the crop on a little bit later, give you a longer extended season. The bending treatments didn't work uh, very well at all, uh, so we won't go back and do that or recommend that. But pinching seems to be a good thing for these primocane fruiting blackberries. Now the one thing that the blackberries did this year that the raspberries did not do is that when the weather turned cold in October. We had an exceptionally cold and wet October this year. The cane, the laterals with the fruit, uh, well, they turned brown. They sort of wilted. Um, th we think this is uh, stress injury from the cold temperatures. None of the fruiting, none of the laterals that did not have fruits, like the vegetative laterals, exhibited this symptom. It was only laterals with fruit on it and we think what's going on here, because the October was so dark and cool that there wasn't enough carbohydrate in these plants, particularly with fruit. So the fruit drew the carbohydrate out of the plant, and the leaves just didn't have enough carbohydrate, didn't have enough ability to make antifreeze or whatever they produced to give them resistance to cold, and they just sort of collapsed. 
So our yields weren't as high as we had hoped. We left a lot of reddish fruit here in the plants that theoretically could have been harvested in a more normal year that had a little bit more light and heat in October. So one of our biggest challenges to producing these plants in the greenhouse or the high tunnel are the high yields we get. And the trellises that we've used were a bit of a problematic. You know, typically in a field, you just get a fence post and you pound it in the ground and you bolt a two by four to it and put a couple wires in and you're off and running. But the problem inside a high tunnel is, you know, it's when your canes are spread out in a V like that, it's a little bit hard to get down the alleyway. You have no flexibility on adjusting these and they're just clunky and they not really that strong actually. So we've been working with a, a fella from Indiana who has this company called Trellis Growing Systems is working on this new kind of trellis that has the capacity to support the heavy volume of weight that you get from the primocanes and the fruit that's produced on those. And this is what this looks like. It's uh, made out of reinforced fiberglass. It's supposed to be stronger than steel but it has a little bit of flexibility. You uh, pound the post into the ground about a foot and a little plate here that holds it uh, square. You bolt this aluminum piece onto it that has pins in it, and I'll show you those pins in a minute. And you can adjust the angle of these trellis arms. And then there's wires here to support the canes. They can be adjusted and slip up and down this uh, trellis arm here to any height you want. So that works pretty slick. So here's black raspberries in an open position with this system. And then you can just pull out the pins and close them up and gives you more space for walking down the alleyway. So open and uh, the way you adjust it is you just pull out the pins, move the bar, and then put the pins back in to whatever angle you want. And it's pretty slick. It doesn't take up a lot of space. He's developed a way to anchor them into the ground. It doesn't use a lot of space around here. And that space inside a high tunnel is pretty valuable. And these wires get pounded into the ground and there's a little device that it catches about a foot down and uh, provides support for these posts so they don't collapse. The rows that we uh, produce here, we're, we have our tunnels are the standard size is 30 feet wide and 20, I, I'm sorry, and uh, 96 feet long. We find that four rows down the high tunnel is best so each of those rows are about seven feet apart, seven and a half feet apart, and that gives you enough space to, to work in between them. The tunnels also are, the size of the tunnels have a four foot extension before the bend starts. A lot of tunnels maybe for greens and all start to bend right away, but we have our sides elevated four feet so we can get the two end rows of raspberries relatively close to the walls of the tunnel, uh, and you have that height there. This is the website of the company that we're working with that has this flexible trellis system and the next presentation Fumi is going to be talking about how to uh, use this type of system outdoors to bring protection to your plants if you don't have a high tunnel and you want to still cover them uh, you can grow them in such a way that they can bend down and be covered with the high tunnel provided you have a decent trellis system to do that. A high tunnel, I'll go through some numbers here in a second uh, how much the high tunnels cost our pre-plant preparation, our tunnel construction, plant establishment, irrigation trellis, we spent $11,096. I mean, we kept really good track. This is how much it costs for everything to build that tunnel, paying somebody and everything. And you say, wow, you know, that's a lot of money, $11,000 for a 30 by 96 foot tunnel. Um, and then the harvest uh, plants and the produce to crop and all that, we have production costs and harvesting costs, which you're gonna have anyway. 4,000 half pints uh, per tunnel, 250 a half pint, you get about $10,000 of yield per tunnel. But when you run those numbers out for several years, so the first year you don't have any money coming in and you spent you know, nearly $12,000 without anything coming in, doesn't sound so good. The next year, first year you have fruit, you have to spend some money getting that fruit harvested, you're going to get $10,000 in sales, uh, that offsets that initial cost second year same thing you about broke even but the nice thing is from about year three on 
you, know, you have very little cost going into that tunnel except for your harvesting costs and a little bit of production costs and then you start running into the black at a pretty high level. We've had these tunnels looked at by several economists and they all say, yeah, it's probably about the best thing we've seen in agriculture in terms of an investment. Uh, you get payback within three years and after that the return is pretty good. Every three or four years you have to replace the plastic and that costs you maybe three or four hundred dollars but it's not three or four thousand dollars it's just a few hundred dollars. We found that that uh, help that three or four hundred dollar cost every three or four years happens whether you put the tunnel on or the cover on just for the fall or you leave it on year round it's about the same. Inter uh, could you intercrop in year one and two? I suppose you could if you could um, put some maybe um, greens or something like that in there and you didn't have too many weeds growing between your alleyways I suppose you could. But that's something we haven't done. Uh, we look at the equivalent yields um, we can get about 20,000 pounds of fruit per acre in a tunnel on a per acre basis compared to about 2,000 in the field. So the yield difference is dramatic and why is that? Well our rows are about twice as close together in the tunnel because we're not driving a tractor down the alleyway. Our harvest season is about two, two and a half times longer and for some reason physiologically you saw those pictures the plants just grow better in the tunnel and the yield per plant just seems to be so much higher. So if you multiply 2 by times 2.5 times 2, you get close to 10 times higher. It's remarkable. And then the yields are higher. I'm sorry, the price you get for fruit off season is higher than it is in season. We have a store that we sell and uh, it's pretty remarkable. And the gross revenue is 150000 per acre. Pretty remarkable. Uh, this can be done with greenhouse production and pots the same way. Uh, we don't have time to get into a lot of detail on that, but the same principles hold, grow the plants in pots instead of uh, in the ground and we have a production bulletin on our website that you can read all about doing this too. And that's what that looks like. And uh, just to end up, I just want to show you some pictures of some growers that are doing this all over the country. This is Michigan, uh, Washington doing the same thing. Some are doing pots, some are doing ground, but the principles are sort of the same. Uh, Simcoe, Ontario. New Jersey. So anyway, we're real excited about the fact that we can manipulate these raspberries and blackberries in different ways to provide fruit over a very long period of time. And it seems like uh, we have an opportunity now in the northern tier of states to really make a dramatic impact on the time of year that our berries are available and get a higher price and increase our yields and increase the quality of fruit all at the same time. All right. So, Laura, that's about uh, you, what Marvin. I wanted to say. Um, there was a question about how often you should replant the high tunnels. So, we have not replanted our high tunnels yet. Uh, we've we had five years of raspberries growing in the tunnels, and we haven't seen any decline in yield or growth or any increase in diseases over that five-year period. So that's pretty good. I can tell you outside that after five years you sometimes start to see uh, the impacts of the weather and diseases and weeds and things like that but we don't have to deal with that in a tunnel so I think the you know 10 or 15 years I think is not at all unreasonable for uh, keeping these plants in a tunnel of course no one's had tunnels that long so we don't know but I think that's right, a reasonable thank guess. Thank you. And there was a question earlier, and I may have been typing because it was when we lost the video, about the wind speed of tunnels. Did you address that, Marvin? The the winds, it was about the wind N speed no, I didn't um, that, that caused that first tunnel that you showed to fall down. Oh, yeah, okay. So that was a tunnel up at Geneva, and that was installed in September one of the hurricanes came up through um, and the wind speed was around 60 miles an hour. It was a hay grove tunnel and the hay groves are three season tunnels, they're not four season tunnels, they're not made to withstand a snow load nor are they made to withstand heavy winds. And the unfortunate thing here was that the plastic was on that tunnel and the wind came on a Sunday when no one was around to take it off. So ideally 
the, that plastic would have been folded down and put in the V's of the tunnel before that wind came through. And just because it was at the university and it was on a weekend and we didn't really predict that high wind, they kind of got caught and the tunnel got destroyed. But typically you can deal with that just by taking the plastic off before that All wind right, comes great. through. And, um, you know, if you folks can wait, the we have a couple more questions and we will definitely get to them, but I want to make sure that we, I forgot to introduce a couple of polls and we're going to do them and then we'll have um, Dr. Takeda give his presentation and I, I promise that we will make sure that everyone's questions are answered. Um, let me introduce a couple of these uh, poll questions to help us get a better idea of um, the experience level of the group and uh, you'll see how to answer them in just a second. Um, so let me make sure they go in and you can just vote and um, then when we get most everybody voting we'll move to the second one. So thank you very much. It just says are you currently growing raspberries in high tunnels? Yes, I have more than one season of experience. Yes, I have planted raspberries in a high tunnel but of just one season. Uh, no, I have not yet planted raspberries in a high tunnel, but I'm seriously considering it. Or no, I, or I have no plans on using a high tunnel for raspberries or blackberries. And if people could just give us that uh, feedback, that would be really helpful. So we have about uh, half of the group voting. And while you're all doing this, I'll um, load up the next presentation. All right, we have anybody else want to vote there? We've got about 30 people out of 52 folks that have voted. Give you another second. Oops, um, somebody has closed the poll. I'm sorry about that. We'll just uh, hide that and then mm -hmm. I'll open up the next one. This one asks if you are currently growing blackberries and you can answer that yes, you are a beginner or yes, you have been growing them for many years and need information on trellising and high tunnel possibilities. Uh, or no, you do not plan to add blackberries to your crop mix because of temperature limitations. Or no, you do not plan on adding blackberries due to an unknown market. Or you are not currently growing blackberries but do plan on adding them to your crop mix. And if you would just give us some feedback, that would be great. And we've got about 27, if we can get up to about that 30 level or so, that would be terrific. All right, I'm just going to close that poll now. Thank you. I have one more to, one more poll, um, and I appreciate Dr. Takeda's patience here. And this just talks about um, using adoption of um, high tunnels. What has what have been or still are the biggest obstacles for your adoption of a high tunnel for a bramble crop? Um, the initial cost of the tunnel, the cost of the labor involved in harvesting the crop, you not, do not know enough about managing the crop in a high tunnel, or you are not sure that your market will support the extended season and or the increased production that you might get in a high tunnel. And you can vote more than once on these. Okay, we have a couple people that didn't have the full view. I'm sorry about that. Give you that. And if you're an extension educator, um, you really don't need to reply. I know that there are a number of you but if you do have any aspirations to grow bramble crops, um, we'd love to get some feedback from you. And I think that's about, about it. So I'm going to shut that pod. 
And now I would really like to, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our second speaker, and that is Dr. Fumiomi Takeda, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm sorry. Um, he works for the United States Department of Agriculture, the Ag Research Station uh, in Kearneysville, West Virginia. Um, he has been involved in developing year-round culture for strawberries, um, utilizing controlled environment, protective covers, and soilless substrates. He also has worked on optimizing production of plantlets in soilless uh, substrates for out-of-season fruit production, and he studied the resource uh, storage and allocation of environmental factors that affect reproductive organ development in strawberry and blackberry. But today he's going to be talking to us about um, another trellis system for blackberries. And Dr. Takeda, I will turn off my microphone and let you take over from here. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about a unique trellising system we had developed here to train blackberries to facilitate uh, harvesting and to improve uh, or reduce winter injury in both erect and uh, trailing blackberries. Uh, if you have grown blackberries in the east, especially in the northeast, you will probably have seen plants look like the shown in the play A, uh, where floricanes in the springtime develop no flowering shoots or so they're bare and kill back to the uh, ground. Uh, we can provide winter protection using the things I'll be t describing this afternoon, as well as use high tunnels and greenhouses to grow blackberries here in the northeast to uh, reduce winter injury and realize a uh, reasonable amount of fruit in the summer, the following summer. Uh, let's look at some of the data published by uh, researchers, uh, such as the uh, butt hardiness of various blackberries, uh, the thornless in uh, semi-erect blackberries uh, when they're exposed to freezing temperatures under controlled laboratory conditions. Uh, when the buds are exposed to temperatures around minus 10 Fahrenheit, uh, Fahrenheit uh, about half of the uh, buds will be killed. Uh, in contrast, the trailing blackberries that have been developed in the Pacific Northwest uh, show 50% bud kill when temperatures are drop only down to plus 12 Fahrenheit so that the trailing blackberries are very susceptible to low temperature uh, temperatures. And Marvin uh, mentioned earlier about how to reduce winter injury and he talked about using structures such as greenhouses and high tunnels to reduce winter injury. Uh, other options are one that one could consider would be uh, growing cold tolerant varieties. Uh, there are some that seem to be uh, a little hardier than others such as uh, LINI Hardy from the University of Illinois and uh, I think the uh, Chester Thornless may do well in the uh, southern Pennsylvania. Uh, you could also take uh, action to reduce uh, winter injury by insulating the plants, such as using structures and other uh, mochi materials, such as straw, plastic, foam, or just covering plants with row cover or ice and snow in uh, certain areas around the Great Lakes area. And all these insulation uh, would uh, insulate plants from the cold temperatures as well as protect plants from cold, dry winter winds. Uh, 
I'd like to now talk to you about uh, what we have done here at Kearneysville, West Virginia in, in the last 10-15 uh, years. Uh, the eastern varieties such as Triple Crown and Apache uh, do well in uh, Zone 6 and uh, they produce 25 to 30 pounds of fruit per plant in the open system. So they do not require any w winter protection to do well in the middle Atlantic coast region. Uh, however, the trailing varieties from Oregon suffer severe winter injury in, in our area. Uh, they're typically killed to the ground every winter. I've been told by Jim Ballanton at NC State, even in North Carolina, uh, trailing varieties such as Siskiyou uh, rarely produce fruit because of uh, winter injury. Uh, Siskiyou, as I mentioned, uh, was developed by the USDA in Oregon and does well in Oregon as well as in various parts in California and it suffers a uh, severe injury when temperature drops down to about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, what I'll be talking now is about this simple winter protection system we have developed here and it, it, it involves the two two ideas that Marvin may have ta uh, have talked earlier is the the use of this rotating cross arm or RCA trellis and an application of floating roll cover over the plants in during the winter months. The uh, rotating cross arm trellis, the RCA, has a, a short post and a long cross arm. that could be rotated about the uh, uh, the uh, post in the ground. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, the Here's uh, the uh, post. Uh, in this case, it's about 30 inches high with the cross arm that is about five feet in length. And there are like four or five wires uh, on this long cross arm. And also has a, a stationary short arm with a wire to catch the uh, lateral canes. But, th but this main cross arm could be rotated to put, uh, to manipulate the uh, canopy of the uh, blackberry plant. The uh, system we had developed here uh, has been commercialized by a uh, trellis growing system in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and they have the uh, 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 improved version for sale. Uh, the Trellis TGS system has uh, components uh, made of fiberglass, fiberglass and some uh, uh, metal parts and it has these two arms, one long one that could be rotated and a short arm to catch the uh, lateral canes and it has a much better uh, anchoring system to keep the uh, post cross arm stabilized uh, during the growing season than the uh, system we had developed here uh, 15 years ago. What this RCA system does is, is, the, it, is that it allows the blackberry plant canopy to be manip manipulated during the growing season and to position the fruit on one side of the uh, row shown here uh, that w 
the system allows about 95% of the fruit to be uh, positioned on one side of the row, making harvesting more efficient. What the system allows is that the, the uh, for primer canes to grow on this training wire and eventually allow the lateral canes to develop on these primer canes, uh, ma develop many more lateral canes that are five feet or, lo or more, so, so that the uh, fruiting capacity of that plant is increased uh, tremendously because of the increased number of axillary buds or flower buds on the uh, long lateral canes. And because the uh, the cross arm could, arm could be rotated during the growing season, it's possible to uh, to rotate the lateral canes that are trained on this long arm to be brought down close to the ground in the winter months, and then that allows the uh, allow us to place the roll cover on this low profile plant uh, structure. How, how is this training done on the uh, RCA trellis? Of course the blackberry plants have primal canes and flower canes and during the gr first growing season for the plant the primal canes emerge from the uh, crown and they grow upright in the in the case of the uh, uh, erect and semi-erect cultivars shown here and on the R RCA trellis what we do is the uh, is this once the uh, these primate canes reach beyond the height of the training wire uh, which is about 20 to 24 inches off the ground, we force them to grow horizontally, as shown here. They're bent and tied to this training wire so that the primer canes grow sideways or horizontally. As you can see, the tips of these primer canes are here instead of uh, growing straight upright. Okay. Dr. Takeda, there's a question. There's a question yes. about the recommended numbers of buds in each lateral in this system. Okay, uh, yeah, I got the question. Uh, let's see. Let me go back one slide and show you this. Okay, I. C I'm not good at using the pointer here. <laughs> yeah, click it on and then hold it. When the button turns dark, yeah, there you go. Okay, okay. Here are the primocanes. Uh, thornless blackberries tend to produce six or seven primocanes during the growing season, but we limit the number of primocanes that we train on the system to three. Oh, three primocanes are tied to this training wire. These are the primal canes. Now, the question was about lateral canes. I'll go to that in a moment. Okay, here we have maybe four primal canes uh, trained up and tied to this training wire. Okay, and as these prim bent primal canes reach the adjacent plant, which is usually five to six feet away, those tips are uh, cut off or tipped, which uh, promotes the axillary buds along the uh, horizontal portion of these three primary canes t to develop, and then lateral canes emerge. Okay. Uh, in this system, we try to let all the uh, lateral canes develop along the horizontal portion. Since we're leaving, th training three primal canes uh, and allowing them to grow maybe five feet or so, and 
in that five foot length there could be uh, 20 nodes here this along this horizontal section and typically you expect to see about 75 70 percent of those lateral or axillary buds to uh, develop lateral shoots or secondary canes so in our system we're getting about uh, seven probably of long lateral canes and since there are three primal canes uh, we could train about well, 20 lateral canes up on this long rotating cross arm. So I, I hope that had answered the question. Uh, this is photo taken later in the summer or uh, early uh, winter. Uh, showing that in this case we have trained two primal canes and bent them to grow horizontally and then in this five foot span we have uh, about 14 lateral canes that have developed and they tend to grow upright if you could you manage them properly and get tremendous length on these lateral canes. Here we've got a lateral cane growing straight up to the uh, top wire which is uh, about five feet of uh, space. So uh, in this photo we, the plants have, were established uh, six feet apart within the row. And once the lateral canes are tied to the wires on this long rotating cross arm, the entire cross arm could be rotated so that the uh, the lateral canes are now very close to the ground. And uh, a floating roll cover could be uh, placed over these plants, shown here. And why do we do all this to grow blackberries in the Mid-Atlantic Coast region? As I uh, showed you earlier, uh, Varieties such as siskiyou and other trailing blackberries from Oregon uh, are so uh, tender that they're winter killed. Uh, like here shown with the lateral canes uh, with no growth and that uh, any la uh, fruiting shoots that develop in the spring are, uh, are really uh, in scarce on these lateral canes. There are some flowering shoes or fruiting shoes that develop on the main cane uh, or the uh, horizontal portion of the, uh, the uh, cane. Uh, n another question here is about cane breakage. Uh, with this training system we rarely get uh, cane breakage. Uh, reason is that by bending the uh, primal canes to about 90 degrees and then forcing them those canes to grow horizontally and then allowing the lateral canes to develop more in an upright orientation uh, allow us to rotate the entire canopy as much as uh, 110 degrees without breaking the uh, the main cane because we're not really bending the cane doing this um, canopy manipulation but uh, twist ca uh, twisting the canes so these canes tolerate more the twisting than actual bending so we are not getting much breakage there are some breakage uh, 
during the uh, early or early summer when the primary canes are being trained up and then bent to grow horizontally, uh, I think we have shown that maybe we get about 5% or so of the primary canes break because of mishandling of these uh, primary canes uh, during the uh, bending operation. But we lose very few canes. If we lose one of those primal canes or break cause break, then we will then yank that cane out and allow another primal cane that emerge from the crown to take its place. Uh, by using this type of training system, uh, we are able to uh, get about 14-15 pounds of fruit from Siskiyou trailing blackberry, which is what uh, is uh, about an average production in Oregon. E in, in the case of Triple Crown and Apache, which do, uh, do not need any winter protection, we have harvested uh, about 30 pounds of fruit uh, per plant at five foot or six foot spacing. So again, uh, show on the left, plant uh, that was not protected in the winter, and then shown on the right, a uh, plant that was trained on the RCA trellis with the canes positioned close to the ground and then covered with the rotating, uh, with the floating roll cover, we're getting uh, good fruit production. Here are some data from our uh, studies uh, performed between uh, year 2002 and uh, 2009 uh, for variety SESQ. We are able to advance the bloom by about seven, seven days and, and this is because uh, this is caused by the uh, application of roll covers up to uh, early March or just prior to bud break. So by adding a little bit of field heat to the plant in early spring, we're able to uh, advance their development uh, and achieve as much as one week uh, earliness and bloom. And uh, plants that were trained to the uh, RCA trellis and then cover with ro floating roll cover in the winter produce 14 pounds of fruit per plant. Now if you have the Siskiyou trained to a uh, conventional trellis or I or T pole system and not cover, uh, those plants produce less than two pounds. If they are uh, trained to an upright cane training system and covered in a vertical orientation, uh, we got close to five pounds. So uh, at this low productivity, it will not be worth uh, growing uh, varieties such as Siskiyou in the system in here in the east. But if they're trained to the RCA and covered during the winter months, we can achieve a uh, much higher yield. There are other benefits to uh, RCA trellis system. S one is uh, that you can h harvest more fruit in a given, a given time. Uh, data we have collected in the past show that uh, as much as 30% increase in harvest efficiency. This is due in part to having 90-95% of the fruit on one side of the row. So you don't have to pick the uh, rows of blackberries from both sides of the row, but concentrate picking fruit from one side because almost all the fruit will be positioned on one side of the row. And if rows run east-west and you could rotate the whole canopy to the north side of the row, uh, fruit will be uh, uh, in a partial shade or complete shade and not be exposed to sun direct sunlight so there is less sunburn damage. Uh, some of the uh, temperatures we have 
fruit temperatures we have recorded in the summertime uh, indicated that the fruit on the south side of the road uh, had skin temperature as much as 20 to 25 degrees higher than the fruit on the north side of the road and in partial shade. So by having lower fruit temperature, uh, you probably have a much better uh, post harvest shelf life. Uh, the things I have discussed today uh, is a non-tunnel winter protection uh, system uh, to reduce uh, winter cane injury and uh, reduce uh, tissue uh, desiccation during winter months. It can be used to uh, extend blackberry production to areas with more severe winter conditions, uh, places like uh, northern Pennsylvania, New York, and perhaps into uh, New England states. Both erect and trading cultivars can be trained to RCA trellis and managed for with winter protection to uh, improve uh, productivity. So that uh, completes my presentation, and we could take Dr. questions Dr. if Takeda, we have time. Dr. Takeda, there was one question about um, was the conventional open treatment, was that an open V or a different trellising system? Uh, in, in this that study, what we did was to train the uh, lateral canes on the RCA cross arm, and then uh, left the canes upright to, uh, to the winter months instead of bringing them down. And then either cover with roll cover or left open. Uh, if you train blackberries to other systems, you pro probably get similar results. The canes that are, are vertic vertically trained and uh, upright would uh, be exposed to uh, much colder temperatures than the canes that are brought down close to the ground and covered with roll cover or snow in the winter. All right. Does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Takeda? I know we had a couple of unanswered questions for Dr. Pritz, but now's your chance, folks. And it's too cold to go outside anyway, so you might as well ask them. <laughs> okay. What? I think there was another uh, question on yield. Uh, we have uh, plants, about 700 pl uh, plants per acre uh, density. In, in the case of Chester, Thornless, and Apache, we have harvested about 30 pounds of fruit per, uh, yes, 30 pounds. In the case of Siskiyou, we're uh, harvesting around 14 pounds per plant. And since these plantings were established for mechanical harvesting many years ago, uh, their s planting rows are about 12 feet apart. But uh, I'm sure these all these varieties could be grown at much uh, closer spacing, say about a 10-foot row spacing. All right, that's great. Um, I don't know, Marvin, if you're still there, if you, uh, maybe as people type in questions for Dr. Takeda, but I know that there was a question earlier about the use of movable tunnels with raspberries or blackberries. Do you have any comments about that? We don't have any experience with that, but uh, theoretically it's an intriguing idea, uh, particularly if you had the summer blackberries and the fall blackberries or summer raspberries and fall blackberries, you could move the tunnel over the fall berries for just that late season crop for say from September through November to when you were done and then you could slide the tunnel back over the four cane fruiting crop that needed the winter protection and use it for that. So you get double use out of the tunnel if you could have a rail system or something like that to slide it back and forth. So, or you know, not even raspberries, but 
you know, greens or something that needed some winter protection. So yeah, it's an intriguing idea. We haven't done it, but people are talking about it, and uh, it'll be interesting in the next couple of years to see okay, if people have figured out ways to great. make that work. Great. Um, I think there's a question here for Dr. Takeda. What is the best orientation to the sun, uh, in your opinion, for those blackberries? Well, if the uh, if you are using the RCA trellis, we're recommending that the rows be established east-west orientation so that the fruit could be positioned to the north side of the row. Uh, about the disease pressures, we thought, but uh, when we were doing mechanical harvesting work and uh, rotated the fruiting, the cross arm, to about a 30 degree about horizontal. We we are getting a lot less Japanese uh, Japanese beetle damage because the uh, berries were all kind of hanging from the uh, uh, canopy. There's an another concern though with the uh, uh, fungal problems such as anthracnose. Uh, so roll covers must be removed just prior to bud break in late winter or early spring. Then apply the uh, the uh, liquid lime sulfur to control anthracnose problems. I'd like to jump in too because there was a question about insects in the high tunnel. If we get increased insects, and in our experience, we get increased mites that we have to watch out for two spotted spider mites, but otherwise we have uh, very few other problems that we've ever seen. Uh, no diseases to manage and uh, the only insect are increased mites because it's drier and warmer in the tunnel. So we do have to pay attention to mites, uh, but nothing else. And then I wanted to make a comment too about row orientation as Fumi did. We also recommend positioning our rows uh, east-west for the tunnel. Now, if you're doing field production, we recommend north-south orientation because you get better line interception when the rows are planted north-south, so the south side of the row and north side of the row get exposure when the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west. But in a tunnel, particularly late in the season, if you want to get the most light intercepted when the sun's low in the south of the sky, you want your rows planted east-west, so the south side of the east-west row gets the most exposure to the southern sun if you're going for All that right. late um, season extension. And there are extension. a couple of questions, I think, for Dr. Takeda talking about training this year's primocane over the top of next year's floricane, um, and then wondering about trellising systems used in the primocane production. And I'm not, I'm not completely sure, um, Dr. Takeda, uh, if I understand that question, but well, uh, about the uh, about primocane training over next year's, or not next year, current year's floricane that has fruit, I would recommend that the uh, this question uh, they go to the uh, some of the uh, files that they could upload, and these uh, reports provide very detailed uh, procedure for manipulating the canes. But what the RCA trellis has uh, two wires at the height of that post. The one training wire with on the side with the short arm, that is the wire on which the primary canes are trained. Okay. And then the lateral canes that emerge from the horizontal portion of the primal cane are trained to uh, or contain their growth between the uh, two cross arms, the main, the long cross arm and the short. They got the angle created with the uh, wires on them. So you're trying to uh, keep the prim those lateral canes growing with within those two cross arms, the so angle created by those two uh, arms of the trellis and then kind of confine their growth to 
to mo more or less the uh, in a vertical uh, direction. Okay, I hope that that helps, and I do want to draw everybody's attention while you're in this phase of the program. Um, you can click on these different handouts and bulletins. There's quite a number of them. Some of them are a little uh, large, but you can still click on them, upload them right to your computer, and I will keep the digital classroom open so that people can do that if they like, but you'll also be able to do that from the archived presentation if you need to log off. Um, there is a question about the how level does a site need to be for a high tunnel? Can they be, be placed on a slope? Um, Marvin, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I see uh, a few questions here f for me. One is probably a level site is the most important thing you can have for a high tunnel. When you buy these kits, uh, they're engineered for having a perfectly level site. So if there's one thing you can do, let's make sure that site is as level as possible. It'll go up a whole lot better and be easier. And I haven't seen anybody placing them on a slope. I think from the engineering point of view, it'd be just really hard to support that. So a level site, I think, is critical. Uh, the Charleston system we used for the Prime McCain Blackberry production, that was the system I showed you where we could basically train the cleans upright but in, into a V so we could bring some of the canes over to one side and some to the other but for prime cane blackberries mostly we're just interested in holding the canes upright we're not doing a whole lot of manipulation on prime cane fruiting crops and then the question on rodents in a high tunnel we're we mowed around the high tunnels real close to the ground the grass before uh, fall came and then we put up chicken wire around the outside to try to keep the rodents from coming in and we also try to secure the tunnel itself as much as we could um, and we'll just have to keep an eye on it to make sure it works. Oh and a question about the Chinese method based on building the earth on the north side of the tunnel and it's built into the slope. That's true I've been to China and I've seen those but the tunnel itself is still the soil underneath it it's still level it's still flat and they make that arch up and it goes into the bank uh, and it's on slopes, but the part that's planted is still pretty flat and level, at least the tunnels that I saw over there. Okay. Um, I did. I, I don't know if we answered one question about venting the tunnel in September and October, and I, I do believe that that's an important thing to be able to do. I, I don't know if um, you want to comment on that, Marvin. Yeah, we keep the tunnels vented almost... Uh, I won't say year-round, but certainly when there's any amount of heat that can accumulate in the tunnel, you want to keep it vented. And we, even on cold days, say November, we'll have the vents open at the top, and we'll leave the sides up maybe six inches or so, just to allow some air movement to come in and move through so it doesn't get so humid in there. Um, and then when the really cold weather comes, like we have now, we'll have everything down to the ground and the vents closed. But we try to vent a fair amount, if nothing else, to keep the humidity from moving through because the plants do better when the humidity is not too awfully All high. All right, um, we have one more question f uh, for Dr. Takeda. Which types of plants should be used, erect, semi-erect? Fomate? Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, yes, uh, I, I think both types of varieties could be trained to RCA trellis. Uh, even uh, trailing blackberries work well. When the uh, prime canes emerge from the crown and they're still 20, 30, 25 inches tall, uh, they're all, uh, can, they all can be bent about 90 degrees to to force them to grow uh, sideways or horizontally so uh, they all can be trained to RCA trellis. There are some cases where we do have problems which is uh, are there could be some vigorous primate canes emerge very early in the season they may be like one inch in diameter uh, and they're, they're more difficult to bend than uh, slightly smaller uh, primal canes. 
All right. Um, I just put up the last poll. I know that we're a little bit over on the time, but I just think that the discussion and the questions have been great, and I really appreciate everybody uh, staying in there for the full length. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, don't hesitate. But uh, we are officially done, and I, I'm going to leave this so that people can download the information. If you wouldn't mind just um, putting your last um, poll response there, that would be helpful. And then our next um, webinar will be on January 20th, two weeks from today at the same time. Um, we will be talking about weed management and brambles. And you all will be receiving a email notification about the connection information prior to that. If you know of people that might enjoy that topic, please don't hesitate to let them know about the opportunity. They do need to, to register separately, but we would love to um, continue to grow this program in the final phase of the um, webinar series. So thank you all very much. Oh, somebody can't see all the choices. I'm sorry. I'll open that up a little bit. Thank you all very much for attending, and thank you mostly to Dr. Fumiomi Takeda and Dr. Marvin Pritz. Uh, for your presentations. And enjoy the cold weather. Bye. Fumi, I don't know if you see that question. There's a question yeah. here from Brent, Brett Bindix about um, growing a plant that produces 14 pounds versus a plant that produces 30 pounds. I think what this individual is talking about is the um, difference between a high tunnel and a regular just growing it outside. Oh, well, I think the question probably is, Relates to right. siskiyou, which produces 14 pounds, compared to yeah. triple crown or a patch that I, produces 30 pounds. I think pounds. so. So is he yeah, still Yeah, I would on? go ahead and I could yeah. still, I, ans I could answer. Yeah, Brent, the uh, reason that we're trying to grow siskiyou in the eastern United States is that it's a very early ripening variety. Uh, we could start harvesting siskiyou here uh, in mid-June. Uh, compared to around July 10th for Apache and uh, Triple Crown and much later for some other varieties. So by growing trailing varieties such as Siskiyou, uh, one could extend the picking season uh, by uh, two, three weeks and get the early crop of blackberries before the uh, Japanese beetles come out of the ground and ca cause a lot of problems. And uh, if you could pick blackberries earlier in the summer, I think uh, the grower can get higher price for the for these uh, early varieties. Well, that answered it that for me. So I think it answered that was great. Thank you. And um, I think that's all the. Uh, yeah, I think everybody is pretty much signing off. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Takeda and Marvin, and have a great day. The rest of you folks, I will leave the classroom on so that you can continue to download. But um, And then this archive will be available in just a few days on the Berry website, as are all the previous eight webinars, plus a few that we did last year, and you're welcome to take a peek at them. And thank you again, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.